scripture tells us that early in the morning on the first day of the week, some went to the tomb, but what they found was empty grave. Angels clothed in lightning said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. Death has been conquered and Christ has overcome.
He certainly did, didn't he? Didn't he overcome? He overcome death, hell, and the grave through the resurrection. And we, we're here today to praise him for that. Our, as we are every Sunday, we come to praise him, the one that died for sin and rose again for our justification. And without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, everything falls apart, don't it? Paul said it well in 1 Corinthians. He said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, our hope is vain. Those that are asleep, are, th- 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 there's no resurrection for them. There's no hope for them. Our gospel is vain. We are false witnesses of Christ, and we're all still in our sin if there's no resurrection. But he went on to say, but he is risen. And that's why we're here today. We welcome you to Duval's Chapel on this Resurrection Sunday. And we're going to worship the one, this one that loved us enough to go to a cross, die there the miserable death of the cross and the shame of the cross. And then the third day was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead through the Spirit of holiness. We welcome you. If you're here today for the first time, we love you guys. We're glad you're here. And we hope that if you don't have a home church, you'll come back and try us again. Okay? And if not, we pray for your home church. If it's a Bible-believing church and you get in there and make a difference for the kingdom of God's sake. If you're here today and lost, God wants to save you. Amen. Thank you. God wants to save you. He wants to save you. There's a lot of things. Who can know the mind of God and who can instruct him? But this we do know, that God wants to save the unsaved. That's why Jesus died. So if you're here and lost, at any time during this service, if I'm preaching, just stop me if you have to. Come to this altar. We will pray with you, whatever we need to do to help. But I'll tell you what, the hard part's been done. Christ died for you, and you can believe in him and be saved. We're going to stand together at this time and call these young men around here. I think they look good this morning. They look good every morning. These guys do. And we're going to receive the offering. This is, um, this is a big part of our worship, and any church's worship, isn't it, is receiving the offering. On the first day of the week, bring all your tithes and offerings into the storehouse of God. You know the scripture, and this is what we're doing. And we're going to give thanks for the offering at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for thy goodness and mercy. This day is a wonderful day. We have come to commemorate and celebrate the resurrection of your dear son, Jesus Christ. What a glorious time this is to know, to know, to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you are alive, that you're alive. You're not a dead God. You're not a totem pole. You're not the figment of somebody's imagination. You're the God of glory and everything through you consists or exists. And, and, and everything is held together because of you. Thank you for every family and home that's represented in this congregation today. For every little child that's here, God. God, that you said of such is the kingdom of God for the, us elderly people, Lord, who have lived a long time and today we still rejoice in the power of your might. God bless this offering. Bless those that give, God. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to
Let's give praise to the Bible to begin with. How's that? If you want to stand, let's give praise to the Word of God. This is my Bible, the Word of God, inspired, infallible, inerrant, alive, powerful, preserved, preserved, sharper than any two-edged sword. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's word will never pass away. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my paths. I will hide its word in my heart that I may not sin against God. Now let's give God a great big hand clap of praise. I want you to turn in the scripture to Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel. Chapter 24, very, very, very familiar scripture. You know, the thing about preaching the resurrection, you can go to any book in the New Testament and preach the resurrection. Why? Because it all points to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As I said earlier and as Paul said 2,000 years ago, if not a resurrection, then there's no hope. But as the songwriter said, Jesus Christ is our living. Not just our hope, but did you pick up on the the verbiage there, the words there? Our living hope. He's alive. He's alive. And that's why we're gathered together this morning. And every time we come together as the church of the living God, that's because he is alive. Chapter 24, verse 1. And upon the first day of the week... Very early in the morning, they came to the the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, wonder why? He had told them. Did he not tell them? Did he not tell them? I must go down to Jerusalem, fall into the hands of sinners and be crucified, but raise again the third day. Matthew 12 and 38. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. Didn't he not tell them? And here they were troubled. You say, well, they were believers. They were the ones that was crying, Lord, we believe, but help my unbelief. Are we not like that today? Has he not promised that he's going to come again and we live our lives like it's never going to happen? Right? So don't don't throw off on these guys. You know, we're much the same, but watch this. There about, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, And as they were afraid, bowed their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember, here it is, how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the the third day rise, rise again. And they remembered the words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bless your holy name on high today. You're our God, the only true and living God who gave his son Jesus at the cross to die for our sin. For God so loved, you loved us enough to do that for us. Now God, we're here to worship you and you only. The God of the Bible, as you are, as you tell us in your holy word who you are, we're here to worship you, God. Bless this congregation, Lord. Bless every individual here. Some, Lord, are members here and have been for, for decades. Others are newly acquainted with this church. And some may be here for the very first time, but God, you know each and every one and you love each and every one. Saint and sinner alike, God, you love us. And we bless you for that. We pray for the saint that you would inspire them today, encourage them. We pray for the sinner that they would be saved. Help me to preach this service and this message, not for fame nor fortune, but to bring you glory and honor and salvation to lost souls. I pray this 
in the name which is above every name. And all of God's people said, praise the Lord. Lord. Say it louder. "Praise Praise the Lord. We ought to be shouting it from the rooftop, you know. We ought to get so loud at Duval's Chapel that Green River Chapel is wondering what that noise is that they're hearing, right? Or Pyre's Chapel or Belmont up in Butler County or Christ's Covenant. Well, you say, well, Brother Gary, you know, why do we have to get loud? Look, you get loud about everything else, don't you? Huh? You shouted the praises of God when that first grandchild, you looked upon that first grandchild. I did. I did. You shout, the, you shout it from the rooftop when if you're a Kentucky fan and, and they make a basket. Not if they win the NCAA. You'll criticize them for that, but you'll shout when they make a basket, right? Or, or Tiger Woods makes a hole-in-one. It's been a while, but if he makes a hole-in-one. Look, we're here today to serve the only true and living God. He knows my name. Think about it. I'm, my name will never be in lights. I'll never write a book. I'll never be deemed as a great preacher. But he knows my name, and that's good enough for me. He knows your name today. Even if your name is not on this church row, he knows your name. Even if you're not on the deacon board or a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or sing in the choir, he knows everything about you. He knows your name. Why? Because he cares for you. He cared enough to send his son to this world to die, not to live. I don't care what the gospel of Oprah teaches. Oprah teaches that Christ came to show us how to live, not to die for us. He came to die for our sin, and he could show me how to live from now on to eternity, and I would never get it right. But he came to live in me, and greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Let's give God a great big hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. I'm going to preach the message, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's a, um, I coined that, really, you know. Uh, That's a new one, the resurrection of Jesus. How does it get any better than that? You know, you know, I thought about preaching uh, the resurrection uh, of God the Son. That was kind of catchy. I thought about other titles to the message, and I don't put a lot of stock in the title to the message, but does it get any better than the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Because that's, that's where it all is today. That's what everything hinges on. Is He died just like the thieves on the cross died. As a matter of fact, he died sooner than those thieves on the cross. So it didn't prove anything. Now it justifies us or it cleanses us from our sin and it redeems us. That's another message. But he died. But thank God on the third day, he's alive again, isn't he? He's alive again. I want to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's go back to the cross for just a moment today. It's, all, it's almost impossible, Mike, to preach one without the other, really. It really is because they're intertwined, intertwined and it's hard to separate them. But there he was, six hours on the cross on Friday. Now, some say Thursday, some say Friday. I'm not going to debate it with you. It doesn't matter. We know he died, right? We know he died. Now, we talk about Good Friday. We celebrate Good Friday and all of that, the day of preparation, the day that, that, that he died, as most would have it, and I lean toward that according to the scriptures. On Friday morning at 9 o'clock in the morning, they had brought him through Pilate's judgment hall. His vestige was marred. His, his appearance was marred beyond recognition. Nobody could, could, can imagine or depict. We used to do the Easter cantata at Belmont Church. And uh, Brother Chad Fleener was over the cantata and put it, done such a beautiful job. Someone told me that they went last night and saw the cantata. Been doing it for 20-something years up there. But he kept, uh, Brother Chad would ask me, Brother Gary, are we going too far? And, and the scourging and, and the beating meetings and what we're doing in the eye of the public uh, to Jesus. And I said, you cannot overdo it when it comes to torturing Jesus because he stood more than any other human had up until his time and lived. He lived through it. Now, I want you to get this. On the cross on, at 9 o'clock in the morning, they pierced his hands and his feet. They nailed him to the cross. And the Bible teaches that it would be six hours before he would give up the ghost. At 12 o'clock, 
And they were all gathered around. There were about four different Marys there, and all of them have a story. And there's a story you can tell from Scripture about every one of them. Four different Marys, and there they are. And they're, they're, they're beholding the Son of God. And he said to his mama, to Mary, the mother of Jesus, woman, behold thy son. And at the same time, he told the great apostle John, who was a, just a Ptolemyne or a disciple at that time, he told him to take care of his mama. He cared about his mama. I said this morning, if you don't care about your mama, you need to get saved. You won't care about anything else if you don't care about your mama. Every mama ought to said amen, all right? All right. So take care of your mama. And they said they were weeping for Jesus. They were weeping. Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife of Cleophas. And, and boy, that's a story within itself. But they were weeping because of what they were beholding there on the cross. And they, he said, women, uh, woman, uh, women of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and your children's children. For if they have done this in a green tree, why? What will they do in a dry tree? He had already prophesied, Shannon, that 40 years later, the Roman government would come, destroy the city and the sanctuary, and Israel would not have a nation again for almost 2,000 years. So there he was, 9 o'clock in the morning. At 12 o'clock, something happened that shook the whole earth, and everyone took notice. They, the, the, there was an eclipse of sin. There was, it got dark upon the face of the whole earth, not just Jerusalem, but the face of the whole earth got dark. And the, the centurion soldier said, surely this was a godly man. Surely he was the son of God. And darkness came. Wonder why? I just like to surmise that God could not look upon his son. God could no longer look upon what he was putting his son through and what Jesus voluntarily went to, and went to Calvary to die for our sin. So the sky was black. No, the, there was no light from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And at 3 o'clock he was hanging there bleeding and dying. The blood was emanating from his brow from his hands, from his feet, and then later from his side. The blood that washed all my sin away. The blood that washed your sin away. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You are not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold from your vain conversation, handed down through the tradition of your fathers, but through the precious blood as a lamb slain, we are redeemed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so finally he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabatane, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All I have to do is look in a mirror. He bore my sin. He drank the bitter cup. And his brother Woody said the other night, you know what was in that cup that he prayed about there in Gethsemane? Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. The wrath of God was in that cup and he drank every drop of it. It wasn't the wrath that he deserved. It was the wrath that I deserved, that you deserved. And he drank it all and he bore our sin. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And it pleased God to bruise him. Why? Because God so loved us. And we could not justify ourselves. I don't care how, more, how much you work, how good you are. You can volunteer at the hospital until you're an old woman or man. You can volunteer down at the, 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 the drug ward until you're an old woman or old man. You can volunteer and volunteer and work and do and be good. And as Martin Luther said in his 95 thesis that he nailed to the cathedral door to begin the, the Reformation, I just can't be good enough. Amen. Guess what? I can't either. Amen. That's why my Jesus bled and died. Right. To take away my sin. Amen. To take away my sin. Now, they took him off the cross. Joseph of Arimathea, a good man. One of the council. And Nicodemus, a good man. One of the council. But in all their goodness, they were lost without hope. But they believed. They saw something in Jesus. Read the Bible. Joseph did not agree with the council 
when they chose to crucify him. He didn't agree. Nicodemus didn't agree. Three times we see Nicodemus in the Bible. The first time he came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto ye, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know the story. You know the story. Then we see him again in John's gospel. John chapter, chapter 7. And he's defending Jesus. They want to judge him. And he said, do we judge a man under the law without a cause? And they wanted to excommunicate him. Does the Bible say that? Just read between the lines. They were starting to shun Nicodemus. He was going to be an outcast. And then finally, in chapter 19, where he comes with Joseph to beg the body of Jesus. They took a crude ladder and leaned it up against the cross, and Jesus is hanging there, beaten, tortured, and dead. His body, his body. The soldier had come and ripped his side open, and blood and water came out. You know what it signified? The birth of the church. The birth of the church. How do you know, Brother Gary? Just read the Bible and let the Holy Ghost teach you. How are, we, uh, how are we brought into the kingdom of the family of God? By a new birth. Mamas, what happened when you went to have that baby? There was water and blood that come forth. The ambiotic fluid mixed with a certain amount of blood, right? Help me out, mamas. And I'm not being ugly. I'm being biblical. And so God birthed the church and birthed us through the church and by his power into this new and living way. And this blood came from his side. The wife of God, the bride of Christ, I should say, the church. Where did Adam's bride come from? This was typifying, signifying that Christ would have a bride. And it would be the church of the living God. Hallelujah. I'm going to get happy in the Lord for this is over with. There's more to the Bible than John 3, 16. Now I want you to get this. They, they tore his hands off of the cross and they tore his feet off of the cross. And, and, and when they looked at the side, they, Nicodemus must have remembered that night when he said, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's that way today, guys. You can't think your way, reason your way, educate your way into this way. You have to be born again. How much did you have to do with your birth, your natural birth? Nothing. You don't even remember it. And it doesn't matter where you was conceived and why you was conceived. If it was a cheap motel room in a, or in a plush palace as husband and wife, you was not a, a product of sin. You were born innocent. Now, mom and daddy may have sinned, but you didn't sin. You were born innocent. And you had nothing to do with that birth. I can tell you, 50-something years ago, I had nothing to do with my new birth, nothing. God did it. And that's why I get in the pulpit and I praise him. And so there it was. They took him and they laid him in a, in a rich man's grave. This is all prophesied way back beforehand that he would make his, they would make his burial in a rich man's grave. And so he did. So he did. And for three days and nights, three days and nights, all of the earth all of the earth was in mourning, even though there were those that had no idea what was going on in Israel at this time. The world was mourning. I'm talking about God's earth, God's creation. Creation knew that something dreadful had happened and all of the angels were silent in heaven. I can imagine them being silent for a space of time. The Son of God is dead. His body's dead. But listen... He was in, the, in, he was in paradise, wasn't he? The body was in the grave, in the tomb. Jesus was in paradise. The, 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 the 
Pharisees came to Jesus. I quoted some of it a while ago. Matthew 12 and 38. They said, Master, if we would see a sign from thee. He said, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah says, Jonas was three days and nights in the heart of the earth, so shall the Son of Man be three days and nights in the belly of the whale, and the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment against this generation and condemn it, because they believed at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. His body went to the grave. His soul went to Sheol or Hades, the heart of the earth. I preach this about three or four times a year. Why? Because it's important for us to remember, right? To remember what happened on these, at these three days and nights. He, his spirit didn't die. When you go to the grave, your body dies and goes to the grave, but your spirit goes back to God, right? Right. Your last breath here will be your first breath in the presence of the living God. Jesus' last breath at Calvary. God, I command unto your hands my spirit. You know what? He would have never died had he not commanded his spirit to leave his body. Never died. Why? Because he is, he is the resurrection and the life. He's the giver of life. No one, no, read the Bible, study the New Testament. Nobody ever died in his present. We have record of three people coming back to life in his present. Jairus' daughter, the widow's son at Nain, Luke chapter 7, and Lazarus when he commanded him to come forth. But nobody dies in the presence of Jesus. Are you in the presence of Christ today? Are you sa What I mean is are you saved by grace? Have you been born again? Well, Brother Gary, my name's on the church row. Not asking that. God's not going to ask that when you stand before him. Well, I've been baptized. That's good. You ought to have been baptized if you got saved. But if you wasn't saved, you just come out of there a wet sinner. Right? You're just a wet sinner. Baptism can't wash your sin away. The only thing that can take away your sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. You've got to be born again, born again. And the spirit of holiness enters you and brings you to life. How, I'm 71 years old as of the 24th of this month, and I've never felt more alive. Now, my body argues that, but my body always has. Because you see in this right here, there's no good thing, nothing. Oh, Brother Gary, you got a nice jacket on. That's all it is. I take it off and there's corruptness without the spirit of holiness that dwells within me. I love this kind of preaching. I don't know about you. Well, Brother Gary, you ought to talk about yourself. You ought to talk about yourself like that every once in a while. You ought to see yourself for as you are. Lost without hope, degraded, dying, uh, full of sin and evil without the love of God and the uh, spirit of the holiness in, in your life. So Jesus was three days and nights in the, in the heart of the earth. He went there to take the keys of death and hell from Satan. That he did. Rome, uh, Revelation. He said, I am he that liveth. I was dead. Now I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and hell. See, Satan had hand, handled those keys for uh, over 4,000 years. 6,000 years. I'll take that back. 6,000 years. Until Jesus came, the last Adam, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. What the first Adam could not do, the last Adam did. He saved us. The first Adam plunged us into sin. By one man's transgression, sin entered into, entered into the world and death by sin. By one man's obedience, we have all become the children of God as we believe. Now, there he is in show. He goes, there's two compartments. There's the evil compartment, and then there's the paradise compartment. All the Jews understood this. And it's brought about in the story of the, uh, of the, la of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man went to the evil compartment. He could see Lazarus over there in the paradise compartment. God, Abraham said, now he is comforted and you are tormented. Oh, send him that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in these flames. He said, son, you remember that in, the, the, in your days you had the good things of life. Now you are tormented, and at Lazarus evil, now you are tormented, and he is comforted. Send him to my brother's house. I've got five brothers that's going to come to this place. You know anybody going there? Do you? Just think, don't nod your head, just think with me. Do you have brothers? Do you have sisters? 
You have nephews, nieces, moms, dads, sons, daughters. We go about life eating, drinking, giving in marriage as if everybody's going to be saved and go to heaven. And most of the time you go to a funeral, everybody's saved and going to heaven, regardless of the hell that they've lived without repentance. That man in hell was thinking about his family that was here and going to come to this same place. But he can become a believer. Two seconds after he got there, he believed in hell. Hell is not popular to be preached today, but it's still in business. Did you know that's why Jesus died? Is to deliver us from that? So he took the keys of death and hell. And he went over to paradise. And for three days and nights, he preached to those that were in prison, according to Peter. Why did he have to preach to them? Because they could not be justified by the law through the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of the ashes of the heifers could not justify them. It had to be the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, all of these guys down through the ages that were patriarchs and men of faith under the law, and we have record of them in the, in the Old Testament, all of these, none of these could be justified by their works. So Jesus died for them. And then after his resurrection, remember what happened? There, many of the saints were seen walking about Jerusalem. Those saints that were dead, they resurrected after his resurrection and paradise was moved to the heavenlies. This is good stuff if I am preaching it, ain't it? Paul said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. I knew such a man that was caught up to the third heaven. That was the Apostle Paul, if you'll study your book. And he was, had an out-of-the-body experience when he was stoned at Iconium and left for dead because he was dead. The body without the spirit is dead. His spirit went, left his body. He went to heaven and he come back and he said, I saw things that I wasn't allowed to come back and talk about. But he said this, after he got back, I mean, I could ask Hannah, what would you see in those national parks out there, you know? And she could tell me, oh, I saw redwood trees. You could drive a car through them. I saw this, I saw that. Some of you been to the beach. Yeah, I saw the beautiful ocean. I'm getting pictures all week of, 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 of images out of St. Thomas down there in the Caribbean. Boy, God showed off when he made the Caribbean, didn't he? Now watch this. They could tell me these things. But Paul said this, he said, I hath not seen, ear heard, neither has it entered into the, imagine, the heart, the imagination of man, what God has prepared for them that love him. I almost got happy a while ago when we got to singing that song about crossing, about to go on, about to cross, that he'd be with me then. He's going to be. Now watch this. So after his resurrection, he is the, there was many that resurrected with him and Jesus stuck around for a little while. But watch this. So now we bring it up to the tomb. The tomb. They went there. The, the ladies that stood at Cal. Did you know they were the only ones that didn't forsake him? Peter and John, all them old boys, they went and they run and hid, didn't they? Mary and the Marys and Martha and those gals, they were there weeping and crying out to him and he spoke to him and he instructed him. Can I give you something? I won't charge you anything else. Did you know when Jesus taught the women, he always taught them out of the book of Psalm? Just study the Bible. Find the places where Jesus is teaching the women and he taught them out of the book of Psalm. Why? Because the girls, the Jewish girls, by the age of 12 had to be able to quote the whole book of Psalm. Now, they didn't have chapters and verses. That didn't come around until the 15th, 1500s. They just had one big book of Psalms. But we broke it down to 150, chap 150 chapters. And you say, well, nobody could do that. I've seen girls do that. I've witnessed it. Young women be able to, in, in Christian, the Christian school that I was a part of at Belmont. But those women would, did not forsake him. And we can criticize the women all we want to, guys. 
But I've been in churches, if it wasn't for the women, there'd be no church. I went to my first pastorate, little old church where I got saved. I went there, there was about 20 people coming. There was a woman teaching the Sunday school class out in the auditorium, men, few men, few women. I don't know what kind of teacher she was. Didn't matter, she tried. She tried. I remember the first day I walked in, I was 23 years old, Eldon. I could maybe quote John 3, 16. She looked at me and she said, handed me the Sunday school book, said, this is your job. I said, okay. But my point is, they helped the church together. The women at Calvary helped things together. And then at the resurrection, guess who brought the message to Peter and John? The women did. Go tell John. Go tell Peter. And they run forward and the tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. And I want to declare unto you this morning at Duval Chapel Church, the tomb is still empty. The tomb is still empty. Now there... Christianity is being despised in this day that we live at a scale here in America like we've never seen. I, I saw some t- statistics. I don't remember all of them yesterday. But, but 20 years ago, 70% of the people in America believed that America ought to be a moral nation. It's down in the 30s now. You know what the Bible is? The Bible is the only moral authority in the world. It's the only moral authority in the world. It's truth. It's absolute truth. It's not subjective truth. It is absolute truth. It can't be changed. If it was subjective, I could insert my thoughts, my ways, what I want into it. But it's not. It's truth. Pilate said, "Who? what is truth? He asked Jesus, what is truth? Truth was standing before him. Jesus is truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But we live in a society now to where Christianity is becoming a a far gone way of life. I'm talking about biblical Christianity, which is the only kind. Educators are being taught not to har Christian teachers. Just read the news. Why? Because they may instill their values into our kids. What would be wrong with that? In 1983, we took the Ten Commandments off the wall because you know what the justices said? Our children may read them and do them. What would be wrong with not committing adultery? Huh? Or loving your neighbor and not coming to school with a handgun and killing your neighbor? What would be wrong with praying to God and having no other God before you? Look what's happened since 1983. You know what the, one of the biggest problems that happened was in 89 when the internet hit the, hit the market. Amen. Jesus died, folks. We, we can despise and hate the world all we want to. But God so loved the world. And what we're talking about here is the population, not the system. He loved the people of the world. And there were no Christians in. Let's not get to thinking because the world is so corrupt, we're not supposed to love the homosexual, the transgender. I hate their ways. I hate their lifestyles. It is an abomination to God. But God don't want them to go to hell. Is this good preaching? God don't want them to go to hell. That's why he gave his son. Oh, this man was a wine bibbler. He was a gluttonous man. He cast out demons by the prince of demons. He enjoyed being around prostitutes. He enjoyed going home with sinners and eating at their table with sinners such as Matthew and Nicodemus. I'm sorry, Matthew and Zacchaeus. They said everything that could be said about him, they said about him, degraded him and hated him. And the world got to believe in it. 
Why? How do you know? There was estimated, they're estimated, the, the people smarter than me, that at one time there were in the 30,000 following him. But when he said, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood or you have no part with me, the Bible says many went away, right? That's when he lost them. Peter said, he said, Peter, will you also go away? And Peter said, where can we go? Thou only has the words of eternal life. I, there's nowhere else to go. So there was a few that just followed him along and then he lost one of them. Judas, Judas. Why? Because they began to believe the lies about him and the lies that are being told today about him. Eric Sieber in his book, Disturbing Divine, I've read part of the book, I couldn't stand it all. Disturbing Divine Revelation, something to that effect. He said that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is two different gods. The God of the Old Testament was a genocidal maniac. The God of the New Testament was a God of love. And you don't have to get it from Eric Sieber. You can go online and see all of this junk that's being preached and it's been taught here by Brother Woody and, and myself. It's, it's there. And they're turning the nation and the world against Jesus Christ. Kids, I want to say something. You're in a church where you're being taught truth. When you go off to schools of higher learning and other places where they, they don't believe what we teach here and what's being taught here, you remember what you were told by people who love you and love the truth. Because you're going to be tempted to doubt what the Bible teaches. That everybody's okay. Everybody's a child of God. Everybody is pure. Everybody's holy. And that's not the way it is at all. If that was the case, Jesus would not have had to die. Right. And so, the tomb was empty. They come and told John and Peter. They run to the tomb. They didn't understand. And the world surely didn't understand. Because now they're believing that he's something that he's not. Look, but Romans 1 and 4 says this. Declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead through the spirit of holiness. They couldn't argue with the resurrected Savior. They couldn't argue with the empty tomb. What is that saying? It's saying that he was vindicated by his resurrection. You know, you can't, you, you, you can't defend yourself against lies. I've learned that as a pastor. You cannot defend yourself against lies. So don't even try. Truth will win out. Because a liar that will lie on you will tell another lie to cover the lie, the falsehood that they told to begin with. Right? Jesus never argued with his liars because he knew that at the end of the day he would be vindicated. And even in this world, look, if you're not vindicated in this world... In the world to come, God is going to judge in righteousness. And everybody will know what the truth is. This is why he died. This is who he is. He's truth. And he wants you to be saved. And he not only wants you to be saved, he wants you to grow up in the Lord. You may be 50 years old and a newborn Christian. And it may take a little while to get your spiritual legs under you, but you can do it. And he wants you to grow in the grace and not. He don't want you to stay where you was. No baby, unless there's something terribly wrong mentally or physically with them, born into this life, stays where they were. I'd have kept my grandbabies about two years old. Man, I wish they could stay two years old. Best time, they're just learning to talk. They're learning to love old Papa. They want to sit in my lap constantly. They want to play with me. And they grow up and then they got buddies. And they don't want to come around Papa like they used to come around Papa. But every stage of life, Jan, seems like the best part. Every stage. But they grow and they change and they develop. As babes in Christ, that's where we're supposed to be. That's why he died. That's why he resurrected. So that we could have new life, a new beginning. I'm not much of a preacher but buddy, you wouldn't want to heard the first tapes that I preached. And I can't quote much of the Bible, but 
I know more than John 3, 16. So the, my only point is, let's grow together in the Lord. If you're just a casual churchgoer, find you a Bible-believing church, get in that church to the point you just feel like you're going to miss something big if you're not there every time the doors is open. This is why he saved us. This is why God gave his son. This is why there's a resurrection. Why? Because in Acts chapter 2, something more miraculous than anything perhaps that had ever happened, happened. The church was injected into history. And it was impossible because it was a Gentile church and the Gentiles had never had the, really the right to God to be called their children, his children. But now God has done it. He did the impossible. All things will be possible, the Bible says. With him nothing shall be impossible, the Bible says. And now there's a church. And guess what? He wants you to be a part of it. The body of Christ. No! We won't always think alike. No! We won't always like each other. Was there ever a time you didn't like your kids? Huh? When, when he got out there and tore your flower bed up. You just got the flowers planted. You go back out there and there they are lying all over the yard. You didn't even like him then. Matter of fact, you jerked him up and busted his glutamus maximus, didn't you? Huh? You get the meaning. But you loved him more than life, didn't you? You loved him more than life and a day or two later you could laugh about it. That's the way we should be as a family of God. You may not always like me, but you can't help from loving me from time to time, can you? Jesus died. This is why he died. There's more to the empty tomb than, than Easter, which I don't even like. Forgive me, but I don't even like the name Easter because I know where it come from. I love the name, the resurrection, morning. Please, please hear this if you don't hear nothing else. If you don't have a church, get in a church and be careful what you go to. I'm told, and I believe it's the truth, that one of the churches here in the county have their first gay preacher, pastor coming. People leaving. They should have left when the Methodists voted to ordain or bring in gay, gay pastors. It had gone too far when it had to go to a vote. I've done voted Jesus. How about you? Done voted Jesus. It's an abomination. How do you know, Brother Gary? Read Leviticus 18.22. Read Romans chapter 1. It's all there. I don't have to vote on it. You don't have to vote on it. God says it. That's the way it is. Get you a Bible-believing church. Get in it. Now, the pastor don't have to, have to spit on everybody on the first three rows like I do. But he ought to be full of a little life, right? Because as the pulpit goes, the church will go. If I get up here and I'm just whole hum and, you know, monotone and, and, and read my sermon off because I got it off the internet. Y'all won't be shouting and running the aisles. Some of you get that on the way home. Let's have church. Let's have church. Three days and nights in the heart of the earth. On the third day, he come alive. Real quickly, i got to teach this because this is the number one question this time of year to Brother Gary. The Bible readers will read the Bible, Kevin. Well, he was buried on Friday, Mike. He was in the grave Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, and resurrected Sunday morning. At the very most, that's just two days and a half, right? Well, did God not fulfill the prophecy? Yes, he did. Well, how do you know? Because God said it. God, because I don't understand everything the Bible says, doesn't mean it's not so. Now, every Bible reader, every Christian has to come to grips with that. You're not going to understand it all, but you ought to study like you think you can and will. But I'm going to give you the answer to the question. There's two schools of thought. I said that earlier. I lean toward the second one. The first one is that Friday was a high Sabbath. 
Friday was a high Sabbath. Now, high Sabbaths were holy days such as, you know, the, the festival, Feast of Tabernacles, uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that was uh, Friday was supposedly the Feast of Unleavened. So they surmised that Friday was a high Sabbath. They had to, and because of that, they didn't, would not crucify him on Friday. They crucified him on Thursday, so he's in the grave Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and rose Sunday morning. No. He was crucified on Friday. He died at 3 o'clock in the evening. 6 o'clock would bring in the Sabbath. Why? Because Jews didn't account for time like we account for time. Any part of a day was a day and a night. In other words, if you, if you, you, you um, let's say Monday, at six o'clock on Monday, Tuesday is starting. It's not Monday evening. Tuesday is starting at six o'clock on Monday. Their time went from evening to mornings, evening to morning, or evening to evening. You know, in Genesis where he's creating, he said the evening and the morning was the first day, right? So, Jesus died and was put in the grave before 6 o'clock. We know that because they would not allow him to be on the cross after 6 o'clock because the earth would be cursed according to Deuteronomy. And it was a Sabbath day. So, they buried him and count the three days and nights. Friday night... I mean, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, he resurrected on Sunday morning. Three days and nights. And get this, nobody argues it. The Pharisees would have said, well, he's wrong. He said three days and nights, and he wasn't but two days and a half. But they didn't argue it because they understood how they accounted for time. Are you getting this? Amen. So God's word's not wrong, it's inerrant. He was there three days and nights as he said he would be. And he rose the third day and he's alive forevermore. And I'm going to close with this, believe it or not. The same spirit that brought Jesus up out of the grave is going to bring Brother Gary up out of the grave one day. This same spirit. Read your Bible. The self-same spirit that brought Jesus up out of the grave will bring Brother Gary and all of you that are saved up out of the grave one day. And we're going to shout to the glory of God. Brother Gary, well, we know each other in heaven. We're not going to be less intelligent in heaven than we are here. I know you here. I'm going to know you there. What will I look like? I'm going to look just like me, whoever me is, right? And you will know me as I will know you. We'll know even as we are known. I don't understand that. I don't either. But it's going to happen. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Get a song. Singers, come on. Get something real pretty, okay? And if you're here and you need prayer, oh, Brother Gary, it's almost 12 o'clock. It's seven minutes till. We got seven minutes if you've got to get out by 12. Well, Brother Gary, I thought you'd let us out by 12. You don't know me very well, do you? Huh? Let, let's sing the praises of God and worship Jesus today while we sing. King of Kings. Mm. Singers, y'all get happy in the Lord. This is a good one. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, 
and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three. You rose, all of heaven held its breath, till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not fade. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me.